The Noah's Ark flood myth from the Bible was also attributed to Zesudra and Atrahasis in Sumerian and Mesopotamian culture. In Aztec mythology, only Coxcoxtli and his wife Coxaquetzal were forewarned of the flood by God and survived by building a huge boat. They wandered for 104 years before landing in Antlan, the Meco Akanesics of Central America say Tezpi built a large boat, loaded it with animals, grains, seeds, and escaped the flood with his wife and children. The Maya say the Great Mother and Great Father survived and repopulated the world after the flood. The Chickasaw Native Americans say only one family and two animals of every kind were saved from the flood. The same basic story is found in almost 600 cultures around the world. Alan Alford wrote, From almost every culture around the world, there emerge more than 500 strikingly similar legends of a great flood. These legends all share a common theme of mankind being swept away, with the exception of one man and his family who survived. We in the West generally know the survivor's name as Noah, but to the Aztecs, he was Nene, whilst in the Near East, he was Atrahasis, Utnapishtim, or Zasudra. As for his means of escape, the Bible describes an ark, or boat. Mesopotamian records describe a submersible vessel, and the Aztec version refers to a hollowed-out log. According to the Aztec legend, men were saved by turning into fish, Ancient texts from the Near East speak of the Flood as a major catastrophe, not a local or trivial event, but a great time divider. There are Flood myths from the Inuits of Alaska to the Canarians of Ecuador, from the Tupinamba of Brazil and the Arawaknians of Chile to the Pehuenche and Yamana of Tierra del Fuego, from the Sumerians and early Mesopotamians to the Hopi, Iroquois, and Sioux Indians of North America, Thailand, Laos, Australia, Japan, China, Greece, Egypt, India, North, South, and Central America, the story is found all the world over, but the claims are quite difficult to swallow. Is the flood just a story, a myth with metaphorical meaning, or a literal account of worldwide flooding? Michael Tassarian suggests perhaps the greatest myth being purveyed is that myths are just myths. In Japan, the Yonaguni megalith is undoubtedly man-made, yet it has been underwater since at least 8,000 BC. It is eight stories high, 500 feet long, with internal and external right angles, steps, rooms, and the stage altar-like area with huge human faces and headdresses carved into the stone. In the Gulf of Cambay, in northwest India, there are two multiple mile-long and wide underwater cities which, taken together, are the size of Manhattan. About 2,000 human fossilized remains have been found in these cities, and have all carbon dated to around 7500 BC. Many underwater ruins have been found off the coast of Cuba, 2,200 feet below sea level. There have been over 200 sunken cities found in the Mediterranean alone. The possibility of a literal flood is not to be scoffed at. Perhaps only the more specific elements of the story are metaphorical. Frank Joseph writes, Plato tells us of an advanced civilization that existed 9,000 years before himself when the Atlantic was navigable and traversed by people the world over. One of the most revealing details of Timaeus is its mention of the opposite continent, an unmistakable reference to America. Its inclusion proves not only that the ancient Greeks knew what lay on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean 2,000 years before Columbus rediscovered it, but underscores the veracity of Plato's Atlantis account. Plato wrote about an advanced civilization 
that flourished in Atlantis around 10,000 BC. He even made the point that some take Atlantis to be a myth, but it is absolutely true. He even said when the flood occurred, figuring approximately 9,600 BC. Atlantean-like legends are on every inhabited continent and always include advanced beings, often revered as gods, with high technology and developed culture. Nearly 600 cultures around the world speak about a worldwide flood caused by angry gods that all but wiped out this advanced civilization. Plato wrote, You do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city, Athens, are descended from a seed or remnant of them which survived. The power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in from the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to other islands. Now in this island of Atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire, which had rule over the whole island, and several others and over parts of the continent, and furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjected the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and of Europe as far as Tyrrhenia. It's interesting that King Atlas is said to have ruled Atlantis, an ancient sunken city in the Atlantic Ocean. There is also Mount Atlas in Morocco, and the etymology of Atlas, or the Atlantic, is indeed from Atlantis. Strangely enough, however, as the Atlantean scholar Commons Beaumont wrote, the word Atlantis possesses no derivation from any known language of the Old World, either ancient or modern, yet among the so-called native races of America, it is a living word. The Toltecs, Nahuatlacas, and Aztecs of South America and all the races that settled Mexico traced their ancestors back to a starting point called Aztlan, or Atlan, in the Atlantic. It was a land they described as too fair and beautiful to be left willingly, which was lost under the sea after a great flood. Aztec temples are called Teocali, which interestingly compares with the Greek Theos, god, and Kalias, house or dwelling of. Europeans, first settling in Delaware and Maryland, found a river named by the natives Potomac, which is just like the Greek word Potomos, meaning river. The native Basques of Western Europe also claim to be descendants from a continent called Atlantica, which sank beneath the waves. The Basque language itself shares no lingual affinities with any other European language but is very similar to Native American languages. The natives of Mindano in the Philippines are the Atas, who have the same flood myth and claim descent from light-skinned invaders who intermarried with the aboriginals. Ignatius Donnelly wrote, Look at it, an Atlas mountain on the shore of Africa, an Atlan town on the shore of America, the Atlantes living along the north and west coast of Africa, an Aztec people from Aztlan in Central America, an ocean rolling between the two worlds called the Atlantic, a mythical deity called Atlas holding the world on his shoulders, and an immemorial tradition of an island of Atlantis. Can all these things be the result of accident? With the Atlantic Ocean and the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, we see the theme of water and hills or mountains being equated with Atlas. This is repeated worldwide. In Japan, Atago is a hill in the center of Tokyo where gods brought civilization to Japan. Atagi are the Japanese priests protecting wisdom from prehistory. In Tongo, Ata Mountain and Memorial are devoted to red-haired, fair-skinned gods who came long ago and blessed the natives. Italy comes from Italia, which comes from Atalia, a word meaning land of Atlas. Italia is also the name of an ancient ceremonial mound in Biarritz. Across the Atlantic, 
The Aztecs also venerated a holy mountain by that name. Atalea is the name of a small Quechua Indian town, and Atalia was a pre-Incan city found by archaeologists and confirmed by local history. In Guatemala, where the Mayan civilization thrived, near Lake Atitlan, is a stone tower called Atalia. The mountains of Indonesian Sumatra are called Atja. The Guanche natives on the Canary Islands call mountains Ataras, and their atlas figure was named Atar. Tenorite, Guanche natives, call themselves Atanach, which means people of the sky god. Herodotus, Diodorus, Siculus, and other classical writers described the Antarantes people who lived on the Atlantic shores of Morocco. Acha is ancient Egyptian for an advanced but sunken city. Egyptian gods or heroes were Atom, Atfi, Athoths, and many other At names. Atchafalia means long river to the Chacto Indians, whose flood myth sinks. Atea is the Marquesian's ancestral progenitor, like Egypt's Adam. Atea Murray is the site of huge megalithic ruins in New Zealand, which contains At and Mu. Atiu is an extinct volcano in the Cook Islands. The Pawnee Indians, adept at astrology with the usual flood myth, had the sky god Atias. Nahuatl is the Aztec's language, and almost all their gods' names end in Atl. Their Atlas character is Atlantiatl, and Atlantica means we live by the sea. The Torig natives of Morocco's name for water is also Atl. The Torigs claim descent from the Atlantes, ancient Moroccans written about by Herodotus, Diodorus, Siculus, and others. Atla was a giantess Norse god. Atlakvith, meaning punishment of Atla, is the name of their written record of their Atlantean oral history. Atlamal is another of these myths, which means the story of Atla. Atla is also an Atomi Indian town in Mexico. The Atomi have a ritual dance called the Akatlaxki, with ten dancers to represent the ten kings of Atlantis from the ancient ancestry. The Aztec sea god was Atlahua, and their great flood was Atamotzli. Today's Alca on the Gulf of Uraba was called Atlan before the Spanish conquest. Atlan is the name of a Venezuelan village of Perea Indians who say their home country was a preposterous island in the Atlantic inhabited by wealthy seafarers from which they escaped the flood. Atlan was home of the advanced Tarascans of Michoacan, who say they were inheritors of a drowned island civilization. Atland is the northern European name given to Atlantis, as shown in the medieval Friskin manuscript Oera Lindebach. Atlanersa was the 5th century BC king of Nubia, whose name meant royal descendant of Atlan. Ateo was a Minoan god thought to be Atlas, and later in Crete, Atana was the name of their language and dialect. Aten was the oldest sun deity in Egypt, and Atanatia was the ancient Aztec sun god. Another name for Egypt's sun god was Ra, like Rama, of the Hindus, Rana of the Toltecs, Rayam of the Yemen, and the Rami Peruvian sun festival. Is anyone prepared to accept all this etymology as coincidence? Could there really have been an advanced ancient Atlantean civilization? Could the myth of a sunken island continent be more than a myth? Francis Lenormant wrote, Upon that part of the African continent nearest to the site of Atlantis, we find a chain of mountains known from the most ancient times as the Atlas Mountains. Whence this name Atlas, if it be not from the name of the great king of Atlantis? And if this be not its origin, how comes it that we find it in the most northwestern corner of Africa? And how does it happen that in the time of Herodotus there dwelt near this mountain chain a people called Atlantes, probably a remnant of a colony from Solon's island? How comes it that the people of the Barbary states 
were known to the Greeks, Romans, and Carthaginians as the Atlantes, this name being especially applied to the inhabitants of Pheasan and Bilma. Where did they get the name from? There is no etymology for it, east of the Atlantic Ocean. Scholar and renowned linguist Charles Berlitz of Berlitz Language Schools spoke 32 languages and wrote many books on Atlantis. He came to believe in Atlantis after his research traced all world languages back to what he thought must be a single ancient dialect. Many famous people have believed in the authenticity of Atlantis. Francis Bacon wrote The New Atlantis, H.G. Wells wrote Men Like Gods about Atlantis, and William Blake the poet was a believer. Two of the best-known prophets in history, Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce, both spoke of Atlantis. Ignatius Donnelly was a Minnesota governor, congressman, and senator who wrote extensively about Atlantis. The most revered and well-known philosopher in history, Plato, wrote about Atlantis, specifically saying it was both a literal story and a myth. Frank Joseph wrote, Iamblichus was an important 4th century Neoplatonist philosopher who insisted upon the historical validity of Plato's Atlantis account, but stressed, as did Plato, its allegorical significance. Selenus told Midas that there was another continent besides the commonly known ones. He said there was a country where gold and silver are so plentiful that they are esteemed no more than we esteem iron. St. Clement, in his epistle to the Corinthians, said there were other worlds beyond the ocean. Diodorus Siculus said that the Phoenicians discovered a large island in the Atlantic Ocean beyond the Pillars of Hercules, several days' sail from the coast of Africa. This island abounded in all manner of riches. The soil was exceedingly fertile. The scenery was diversified by rivers, mountains, and forests. It was the custom of inhabitants to retire during the summer to magnificent country houses, which stood in the midst of beautiful gardens. Fish and game were found in great abundance, the climate was delicious, and the trees bore fruit at all seasons of the year. The ancient Greek poet Hesiod described the world before the fall, saying, Man lived like gods, without vices or passions, vexation or toil. In happy companionship with divine beings, they passed their days in tranquility and joy, living together in perfect equality, united by mutual confidence and love. The earth was more beautiful than now, and spontaneously yielded an abundant variety of fruits. Human beings and animals spoke the same language and conversed with each other, telepathy. Men were considered mere boys at a hundred years old. They had none of the infirmities of age to trouble them, and when they passed to regions of superior life, it was in gentle slumber. Ignatius Donnelly wrote, The religion of the Atlanteans, as Plato tells us, was pure and simple. They made no regular sacrifices but fruit and flowers. They worshipped the sun. In Peru a single deity was worshipped, and the sun, his most glorious work, was honoured as his representative. Quetzalcoatl, the founder of the Aztecs, condemned all sacrifice but that of fruit and flowers. The first religion of Egypt was pure and simple. Its sacrifices were fruit and flowers. Temples were erected to the sun, Ra, throughout Egypt. In Peru, the great festival of the sun was called Rami. The Phoenicians worshipped Baal and Moloch, the one represented the beneficent and the other the injurious powers of the sun. Homer, Plutarch, and many other ancient writers mention islands situated in the Atlantic several thousand stadia from the Pillars of Hercules. Pillars, obelisks, and towers have all been shown to have Masonic significance. Hercules performing his twelve labors has been shown to reference the sun, the mushroom, and consciousness in general. So are the pillars of Hercules real or metaphorical? Is Atlantis real or metaphorical? Is it both? During a chance meeting with a Native American wisdom keeper on a New Mexico hiking trail, author Greg Braden was told the following story. A long time ago, our world was very different from the way we see it today. 
there were fewer people, and we lived closer to the land. People knew the language of the rain, the crops, and the great creator. They even knew how to speak to the stars and the sky people. They were aware that life is sacred and comes from the marriage between Mother Earth and Father Sky. In this time, there was balance, and people were happy. Then something happened. No one really knows why, but people started to forget who they were. In their forgetting, they began to feel separate, separate from the Earth, from each other, and even from the one who created them. They were lost and wandered through life with no direction or connection. In their separation, they believed that they had to fight to survive in this world and defend themselves against the same forces that gave them the life they had learned to live in harmony with and trust. Soon, all of their energy was used to protect themselves from the world around them, instead of making peace with the world within them. Even though they had forgotten who they were, somewhere inside of them, the gift of their ancestors remained. There was still a memory that lived within them. In their dreams at night, they knew that they held the power to heal their bodies, bring rain when they needed to, and speak with their ancestors. They knew that somehow they could find their place in the natural world once again. As they tried to remember who they were, they began to build the things outside of their bodies that reminded them of who they were on the inside. As time went on, they even built machines to do their healing, made chemicals to grow their crops, and stretched wires to communicate over long distances. The farther away they wandered from their inner power, the more cluttered their outer lives became with the things that they believed would make them happy. No one knows how the story ends, because it isn't finished. The people who got lost are our ancestors, and we are the ones who are writing the ending.